This video is about the old way and the new way of cutting turning blanks. Old way, use a chainsaw, cut a piece of wood that's often irregular and got blemishes in it. And the new way, perfectly round, perfectly parallel, smooth surface ready to go on the lathe with no imperfections in it. And this is faster. Stick with me. I'm going to show you how to do it the old way and the new way. You'll learn a lot. Stay with me. I'm going to demonstrate the old way of making turning blanks out of a log using a chainsaw. The first thing you want to do is you want to find the pith of the log. In this case, it's right there. It's kind of a little off center. One thing you don't want to do is ever have the pith inside your bowl blanks. I'm going to take and use a straight edge to make sure I've encompassed that uh, pith. And then I'm gonna figure out how wide I want my bow blanks. Uh, look like I can get about a four inch bow blank if I mark it right there. Four inches deep. And by cutting this off, I get a flat bottom. On this side, I can get about a seven inch one or come back here and do a three, one, three inch one, shallow bow. Three inches is right there. Move it over a little. That's three inches right there. And that leaves me with about a five inch bowl over here after I clean up this side. So, Got a five inch there. This ended up being four and a half. Four and a half bow blank over here. All right, so the old way of doing it was mark out and cut with the grain. I will then take and figure out how wide my log. It's 17 inches. I'm gonna come back here to 17 inches and make a mark. Once I've done that, I am ready to start cutting my bow blank out of a log with a chainsaw. As you can see, one of the really hard things to do with this method is keeping the chainsaw both swinging left to right and keep it from cutting a curve left to right. Keeping the chainsaw in the right position is important. It's hard to do that. You noticed I left the, the blank attached to the log while I cut it apart. Well, it made some marks on this end of the log, so either I can continue on with those marks or, or cut a piece of the log off and start again. Uh, some people like to cut the log off and then cut those side pieces. The problem is you gotta keep that log from rolling while you do, and that's kind of dangerous with a chainsaw. 
So, two methods. This is one I prefer, it's safer. Using the old method, what you do is after you cut your chunks of wood loose from the uh, log, you would uh, then take some kind of template or a compass, either one of them work, and draw out your wood blank. I kind of like to know how big they are without having to stop and remeasure and remeasure. So I usually put the, the size on them. It saves a lot of time in the end. All right. Once we got a round cut on the old method, then we take a chainsaw and cut the corners off like this. And you can cut a little closer do a better job, but still it's going to really beat you to death once you put that on the lathe and start trying to turn that into a round piece. And that's why I think it's so important for you to look at the possibility of the new way. You don't have to knock corners off, it's round already. So that's the old way of doing it. Now we're going to take you and show you the new way of doing it. Cutting turning blanks, the old way and the new way. I've showed you the old way already with the chainsaw, and now I'm going to show you the new way. We're going to start off by using the sawmill to cut this big log, which happens to be 20 by 21 inches diameter, into slabs. Now, the thickness of those slabs is personal choice. Do you want a 3 inch thick bowl or you want a 6 inch thick bowl? So you need to decide that as we cut the slabs off and then we'll cut those out of there. Uh, little logs does not work. If you are got 10 inch logs and, and uh, you think about using this method for bowl blanks, it just don't work very well. The bigger the log, the more efficient it is. Uh, normally we try to get as big as log as will go on the sawmill to cut these slabs and that just makes it more efficient to, and better choices. Remember one thing that this method this new method does is it gives us a better quality bowl because we can look at both sides of the bowl before we decide where to take it out of the log. In other words, if it's got a bad knot or something, man, we can just skip that piece uh, and not have it in our bowl. Whereas the chainsaw thing, you've got no idea what's inside you after you've already cut it. So we'll be able to make that judgment before we cut it into bowl blanks. But right now we're going to slab this thing to get ready for bowl blanks. This is what you get when you stay with me and we take this log I just showed you and we make it into 56 bowl blanks. Uh, takes about six hours. We can turn it into all of these. These are ready to go on a lathe. Even got anchor seal on them. So I'm going to show you the process, but the problem I'm running into is I can do it very quickly and it's very efficient as a process but to explain it to you, it takes a long time. So you're gonna find this video runs pretty long. Uh, I have cut it and edited it, trying to get it shorter and shorter, and I just can't figure a way to get it any shorter without sacrificing information that you need to know. So bear with me. It's a long video, but uh, you'll get a lot out of it. In sawmilling, there's always a lot of waste wood as you square up a log and get it uh, ready to uh, make lumber out of. Uh, a lot of sawmillers just throw that stuff away. But considering I'm a woodworker and a wood turner, we'll save this. This slab is a two inches thick uh, piece and it's not continuous. So we'll take this slab up to the bandsaw and cut either bottle stoppers or uh, pin blanks out of it. So it doesn't get thrown away, it's just not really any good for bow blanks. So we just repurpose it. Always get the sawdust off your slabs. That cause mold and mildew on them. Now 
We got some spalding going on here in the end. I didn't explain when I was using the chainsaw to show the old way, I was using the sycamore log. Well, it wasn't quite big enough for this operation. So I went down and got one of my pecan logs. This pecan log has been laying back there a couple of years and that's what I do to spald them, hopefully put the black spall lines in them. So I'm seeing a little of it in here. We'll hope some of it is in our bowl blanks that we're gonna cut. Now at this point, we need to decide how thick we're gonna cut our, our uh, slabs that are gonna be bowl blanks and where we're gonna get them. Uh, to start off with, this has got a, a fairly large pith in it and I've got it circled here. So the first thing I'm gonna do is figure out how much I'm not gonna cut out of that. We'll do that in a method, something like this. If I can hold my tape measure straight. And then we're gonna do it again up here. All right, that's the center of the log. We don't want the pith in there, but I'm gonna cut a three inch slab out of the middle of the log. And this can be salt and pepper shakers or whatever you want in the spindle turning type stuff would be made into billets. It'll also make a three inch thick piece of lumber if you wanted it. So now that we know what we're not going to take for bow blanks, we can start looking at what we want for bow blanks. And that leaves us here, I'm reading five and a half inches. So I'm going to say that I'm going to leave that thing right there and cut a six inch bow blank on this side. If I just cut right along the pith line, that'll give me right at a, a five and three quarter inch or six inch bow blank. Below that, I'm going to say I'm going to get a three inch bow blank, which is going to be right there. And then that leaves me with a about a four inch bowl blank time I flatten this thing out, cut the bottom off of it and get it squared up. Something like, that says four and a half inch. So that on the bottom I can get a three inch slab and a four and a half inch slab. The top I can get a six inch slab. So we're gonna get three bowl blank slabs out of this log. The middle we will use for other purposes. Depending on uh, which way the wind blows, I sometimes will get this strap and pull the sawmill rather than push it so I don't have to eat the sawdust coming off of it. It's uh, not good for your lungs and sure will make you itch. One nice slab of six inch bow blanks.
If we cut all we can on this side, we're gonna flip the log over and start cutting from the other side to get down to the core. I'm going to transfer these markings to the other end so that I know I'm cutting parallel. As you can see with that cut, I only end up with two places where I got a flat bottom to my bolt, bolts. The uh, rest of this needs to be cut farther, otherwise you're going to have to cut it off on the lathe. And part of this procedure is it saves us time on the lathe of roughing out material. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to cut it one more inch down and that should get us some more flats to the bottom of our bolt. Nice spalded material. You think there's waste? No, it's one inch thick. That's pin blanks right there. Now you see, with just that one little adjustment, we got bottom flats to our bolts. We can uh, then decide how much more flatter we want them later on when we get them on the lathe. So it ended up being three and a half inches thick. But we still got a three inch one here to cut off. One more cut. That pecan's one heavy piece of wood. Now I'll show you the real beauty of doing it this way and what we get out of it. Cutting bowl blanks, the old way and the new way. Well, we're just gonna show you the new way. Uh, we've went to the sawmill and we've cut up these slabs. This particular slab is three inches thick. And uh, what we're gonna do is turn out exceptionally good turning blanks. And here, here's the method we use. One, you would look at this and you would say, wow, that's a big imperfection in the wood. I hope it don't end up my bowl. Well, that's where this method really pays off on the thing is we will outline the problems with the slab before we ever decide which bowls we're going to take out of it. So we don't start really on what's going to be the top of the bowl because sometimes a knot or an imperfection will appear on the back side of your bowl, but not on the front or you know, once you cut it out, out of here. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna tilt this thing up so we can look at the bottom of our slabs. And from there, we're gonna mark from the bottom, mark it on the top so that we know where that imperfection is so we can avoid it as we lay them out on the top. Sounds confusing? Stick with me and I'll show you how it works out. All right, now we're gonna continue on with this. This is going to be the bottom of a bowl that if I, as I cut these out, this would be the bottom of a bowl. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look on the underside here and try to find any imperfections. What I'm seeing right here is a split in this thing. On the top, it don't look too bad, but it looks terrible on the bottom. So on the top, I am going to mark it that that can't be a bowl blank. 
and th this mark here matches the mark on top. So, cause I'm gonna lay out my bow blanks on the top, but I need to know what imperfections are underneath. So I'm gonna walk on down here. That looks good. I do see one imperfection on top that's not showing up right here. It looks good, but there is a uh, knot right here on top. And, and that's what I was talking about earlier. Sometimes it show up on one side and not the other. All right. All right, we're gonna move on down and look at some more log here. And what we're seeing here is an imperfection on here. So I'm just gonna reach over the top and mark that out, what I'm seeing underneath that I do not want in my bowl. Now on the top, what I see is this bottom imperfection actually goes at an angle up through there. So it's not showing up in the same place on top. So that means I've got to cut a bigger piece out that's non-desirable wood. I don't see any other imperfections there is some small limb knots right here. Yeah, small limb knots there, but they're not showing up on top. So I think that will be all right for the bowl blank. They're not coming through. There seem to be shallow pin knots on the outside of the bark. So we're good to right here. We've marked out all the problems on the thing. And so that's took care of the bottom. So give me a minute to readjust and then we'll start laying out the top. As you can see, I have uh, some templates here that we're gonna lay out the bowl blanks with. Uh, I just took some 1 8 inch plywood and uh, made them on a circle jig and now I can mark out bowls of different sizes. Just to simplify my inventory, uh, I've got them cut in two inch increments of diameter. So, and I've even got them larger than that. But most people, you know, if you have a mini lathe, you only need these four, or a mi mighty lathe, a mid-sized lathe. If you've got a big pyromatic or one way or something like that, yeah, you're gonna turn bigger bowls. So you do what, you cut out bowls that for your needs depend on what you're turning. Most people will only need these, so we tend to stock more of that size, a smaller size for that reason. Okay, so let's get these out of the way. Uh, so we're gonna come down here and I've got some beautiful grain right here. It, it is some beautiful spalding of the wood. And I'm thinking that given my undercut here, eight inch is too big, but I can get a beautiful six inch. I got a little end cracking I'm gonna avoid here. So right there is what I want. And there's a six inch bowl blank with some great spalding inside of it. Now, always when you're doing this, Mark the center so that you know where the center's at to keep you having to go back constantly and measure these to see what size they are. I write the diameter of the bow blank on the bow blank. It just saves you a lot of time later on. All right, I have a little bit of bark inclusion here, but I've got some nice spalding I'd like to see. And it looks like by fudging a little bit here, I can capture part of that spalding and probably deal with the uh, imperfection in the wood just by taking maybe a half inch off my bowl. And that is an eight inch bowl. Now, we we'll come down here, there's some beautiful wood right there. Let's see if we can't get, now I can do that. I can get a really big bowl out of it. Now, keep in mind, I gotta make sure that I've still got wood underneath since the 
the tree is, is cutting under on me. But if I took a 10 inch bowl, I could probably get a 10 inch there. Nope, can't do it. Thought I could get a six inch, can't do it. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna capture as much of this as I can because that's the prettiest part of the wood. And that is a 11 and a half inch bow blank. Why isn't that a 12 inch bow blank? Because if you have a mid-sized lathe, you can't put really put a 12 inch bow blank on a 12 inch, or what they say is a 12 inch thing. Because if there's any imperfection on the outside of it, it'll hang on the bit of the lathe. So we cut them 11 and a half inches and uh, that assures that they'll go on a mid-sized lathe. So, experience talking there. We've learned what not to do. All right, we still got some spalding here. We got some beautiful little pin knots here. We actually look like we've got a little bit of insect damage, but it's actually beautified the bowl. It's showed up and it's starting to uh, spald it. So that's a good thing. But I'm gonna try to sneak in here. Now notice that I'm leaving a space between each bow blank. That's so that I can get a chainsaw in here and cut that here in a little bit. It's gotta be wide. We gotta leave a, a space of about three quarters to one inch, depending on how good you are with the chainsaw, to uh, keep from messing up our bowls. I'm gonna come in here and lay an eight inch bow. There's my gap. And again, I'm still dealing with this problem here that I don't show up in a bowl. There's an 8 inch bowl and if I squeeze I can get a 6 inch bowl right there. Coming on down you know, that's pretty wood. I believe I'm gonna try to get one big bowl blank out of that. Let's go for a 14 inch bowl blank. I've got a big pyromatic lathe that I can turn these big bowls. And since this is three inches thick, a lot of times I'll turn them into either shallow bowls or platters. So, all right. 14 inches. We're back to the beauty of this system. If I just cut this out of a log, I wouldn't have any choice. That would be in my bowl blank. So it's an imperfection. Don't make your bowl look any better. Of course, it depends on the shape. I'm gonna say though that I can cheat right here and get another six inch out of here. Here's a question. We've got wood right here that we're, it's too small for a bowl blank. So what do we do? It's three inches thick. Why don't, when we cut this, try to get, that can be a short salt and pepper shaker. We got another place down here. That's actually a piece of spindle wood that you can get out of that one. So don't think everything has to be a bow blank. After you do your bow blanks, figure out what kind of wood you can save for other purposes. Come on down. All right, we've only got now, at this point, it's a good idea. What size bow blank do you use the most? Uh, as I was saying earlier, if you got a mid-sized lathe, what I see the mid-sized lathe people using the most is an eight inch bow blank with some 10 inch bow blanks. But notice we haven't laid out a single 10 inch bow blank. We've laid out two eight inch ones or three eight inch ones and everything else is bigger or smaller. We got plenty of six inch ones. 
and three eight inch ones. So we need to get some 10 inch bow blanks in here. So we're gonna go right here. And we wanna make our inventory sort of even and we want to make it match what we're turning. If we're turning a lot of 10 inch bow blanks, that's what we need a lot of out of this slab. So keep in mind your inventory as you go. All right. I think we can get another 10 inch one right here that may have a little bit of this problem in it, but we'll see. If not, it could be a nine inch bow blank as we turn that out. 10 inch. Nothing like a disruption <laughs> of that caliber. Uh, all right. Now, right here, I'm seeing a, that's punky rotten wood. May it, unless you really look close, you might think that's spalding, but that's, that's actually rotten, so we want to avoid that. And then I'm seeing that I can get an eight inch bow blank right here out of this. So what we've accomplished here is we have laid out all the usable wood that is perfect, that is good wood. We have avoided all the bad wood in the slab. Rotten place here, big bark inclusion here, Bar conclusion here where the limbs tried to crotch out. So we have saved ourselves from cutting up a bunch of wood that then we get in there and find out that it's got so many imperfections in it, either we gotta doctor them or throw the blank away. So what this method does is allows us to choose the very best wood out of a long string of wood that we've examined from both sides. Don't forget to do examine it on both sides before you lay your blanks out with your template. All right, we've laid out of our bowl, of our bowl blanks and saved our best wood. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take a chainsaw and we're gonna just cut these loose. Chainsaw cut. Chainsaw cut. Chainsaw cut. Chainsaw cut. We're really trying to get that cut is what we're trying to do. If you have to, sometimes you have to go back the other end and start and work this way, but just get a, a plan of how you want your chainsaw cuts to be and then just lay them out and try to save these odd pieces of wood as much as you can. Uh, sometimes it's not stable because there's no real way to cut them out of there, but should be. So out of one 10 and a half foot slab, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. We have 22 bowl blanks out of one slab. All of them are near perfect. All of them are perfectly parallel to each other on the top to bottom. When we take them, after we cut them out with a chainsaw, we will take these hunks of wood and go in here in the shop on a circle jig on a bandsaw and cut the outer edge so that it's also very symmetrical. And then you can just put them on the lathe and go to work. So our next step is chainsawing. 22 bowl blanks out of this one slab. We still got two more slabs to go. We're gonna have a lot of bow blanks. All right, yesterday we laid out all the uh, circles on this where we're gonna have bow blanks. Now it's time to use a chainsaw and cut them loose. Sometimes it's just hard to get to them in there, so we have to go to plan B.
As you can see on this piece, there's no good way to get in here with the chainsaw. So I'm gonna leave this as one hump, carry it to the shop, and I've got a little 3 8 bandsaw blade on a bandsaw that I can get right in there and cut those loose real easy. So sometimes chainsaw won't do it out here. We have to rely on other tools to finish cutting our blanks loose. So we'll save that and cut it loose in there. All right, so far that is the total waste of this whole, cutting a whole slab out. Now we'll have more waste later on as we take this in the shop and put on circle jig, cut these corners off. So you might ask yourself, what do you do with all that little chunks of wood that really can't make anything else out of? They're just not big enough. Let me show you. Remember, you're in Texas. <laughs> This is pecan wood. Pecan wood makes an excellent smoking wood for your barbecue pit. Uh, when I cut up mesquite logs and into slabs and stuff, I save all the waste because there's nothing better than to take some pecan wood and put it on here for barbecue and then throw a few chunks of mesquite on top of it for flavoring. And you can make some real Texas barbecue. So, you can use your chunks of wood. They don't all just go in the burn pile. There's uses for them.
All right, here's our 22 bowl blanks out of one three inch slab. Got a lot of corners on them at this point. We're fixing to take care of that. Let me show you how we do it. We had one problem. Uh, these bowl blanks were laid out so close that I couldn't get the chainsaw in to cut them out. So first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna use the band saw and a thin 3 8 blade to work our way in between these bowl blanks and cut them out with their individual blanks. All right, we've got this uh, circle jig here. The commercial ones that you buy are just too small for what I normally do, so I made this version of mine. It will allow me to turn bowl blanks up to 24 inch radius or, or four foot diameter if I wanted to. In other words, I can use it for woodworking and make tabletops. But it has a 3 8 inch pin here that everything rotates off of. And using the Highland Woodworking's 3 8 inch wood turner's blade, we will proceed to cut all these blanks into circles. First, we have to do something. We've got to take all 22 of these blanks and just for convenience, we're gonna take and, and uh, stack them up over here on my joiner to where, stack them up on my joiner to where they're stacked by size because we've got to change this pin on this every time we change to a blank. So we're gonna do all the six inches first and then we'll do all the eight inches and so forth. We'll do them in groups, saves time. Remember that a big part of this thing is not only to get a better quality blank, but we're gonna be turning out a lot of bulk, really high quality bow blanks very quickly because we can make these things go through here quick once we line things out. So we're going to restack the blow blanks and then we've got to drill them with a 3 8 inch hole for our screw chuck. In order for us to put these blanks on the circle jig and start cutting them, we've got to have a center mark hole. This is a safety issue. This is a 3 8 inch screw chuck. And um, there also is a 5 16 which is one size smaller. We've had some accidents in our shop, our wood turning club, with that 5 16 screw chuck. It, uh, uh, you get an 8 or 10 inch bowl on there, it will tear the thread, the wood out of it with the threads and come off your lathe. So we banned all the 5 16 size ones in our club and we only use the 3 8 inch screw chuck. It's fatter and got bigger threads. So what we're shooting for is we want to drill a hole with a 3 8 bit in our wood so that we can go put it on our circle jig. And once that's happened and we used our circle jig to make us a round bowl, you're ready to just walk up the lathe and stick it on there and go to work. Now, after you turn all these blanks and get them round and you go to your lathe, you need to check one thing before you try to screw them on with a screw chuck. Yes, we're drilling these holes one and one quarter inch deep. There's some of these screw chucks are shorter and some of them are longer. So whatever you've got's okay. But the first thing before you put it on that lathe is you take a set of calipers and push it down and measure it and make sure that you've got that much depth in it or you got to use a spacer. So always check that because it's dangerous to screw this in only halfway, say it hits bottom. So check that as you put this on your lathe.
Now that we've drilled our hole in our uh, bowl blank, I'm going to start off with this 14 inch bowl blank, start the biggest and work back to the smallest. Uh, just the way I like to do it. Uh, so we've got to set our machine here for a what is half of a 14 inch bow blank. So we've got to set this at 7 inch radius. This jig sets it at the radius, not the diameter. And right there it is. It's a little tough sometimes to uh, see where the hole is in your blank. So one of the tricks I use is I'll uh, use some bright chalk and then when you look under there you can see it where the hole is better to get it on the hole. And there it went. Now if I start turning like this, I'm going to push this. First thing I'm going to do is not turn this and go straight in till I bottom out. There's a stop right here. Once it bottoms out, then I'll start turning. Now the problem is I'm going to be turning inside the wood and sometimes the wood will move and trap your blade. So one of the things you want to do before you start on any of your big blanks is take and nibble these corners off were so that when you spin it to cut it off, these things will just come off in four corners. Besides, what are you going to do with a big round tire with the tire missing? Uh, if I cut this in four quarters, remember back to the barbecue wood and what you can use these pieces for? You're going to need them in small pieces anyway, so might as well do it right now. Push in all the way till it won't go anymore. And then I'm just going to let it take its time to do the cutting. And see, here comes our chunks off. Some reasonable sizes. a 14 inch full blank ready to go on the lathe when it's dry <laughs> we got some other things to do to it first one down you may wonder why I wear these gloves I, I buy these at uh, Home Depot three of them at a time for ten bucks uh, they're cheap and they get wore out pretty quick. And they get wore out because they got real soft mold skin right here on the front of them. But what that allows me to do is turn this thing and grip it. Without it, I'm one, I could get a splinter in my hand. Second is my hands would get slick and not hold on. This helps me grip these blanks. So it actually makes it safer for me to do this. All right, moving on. You get the gist of what we're doing here. I've got uh, 11 more six inch bowl blanks to do. But uh, looking at this, after I've brought them in here from outside, we're gonna be able to cut 
22 bowl blanks into circles, drill them, put them in, and make them into circles within about 45 minutes. Uh, when we get through with this, stick with me, I'm going to show you a chart of how efficient this is and how many bowl blanks you can make in just a few hours. Uh, and the thing about those bow blanks is they're almost perfect. Uh, you have eliminated all the wood problems in them. So uh, think of that. Get a better quality thing, but get it faster with less work. New way of doing bow blanks. Kind of wanted to show you this. This is all our 14, 11 inches, 10 inch, and 8 inch bowl blanks. And this is all the waste wood we've got off of all of them. But I've cut it into small enough pieces that that can be repurposed as, repurposed as firewood or barbecue wood. So this is pretty efficient about not wasting wood from your logs. So that's just what it amounted to right there. And that's a uh, little about two thirds of our bowl blanks are cut. And then we ended up with nine six inch bow blanks. Nine of them. Get these out to a drying rack. I'm gonna have to stop and change the blade. The thing is very dull. Alright, now that we have a new blade on here, it should cut a lot better. That's all the six inch slab uh, bowl blanks. As you've seen there, cutting a six inch bowl blank takes just a little more work and effort than uh, cutting a three inch one. Uh, it also makes a big difference if the blade is sharp. You've seen how when I started out the blade was dull and uh, 
as soon as I changed it, it's got a sharp blade on here, it just really started uh, cutting really well. But it's still, it's slower doing the six inch slabs than it is uh, doing the three inch. But that's just the nature of the beast. Well, we've uh, cut all 22 of our bowl blanks into circles on our circle jig in there. And uh, here is the issue with this method. These are 22 bowl blanks, but we've got three slabs. So we've got two of them to cut up. We're gonna have 66 bowl blanks or there about time we get through. Uh, the problem is one person can't sit and turn all of them in a week so that they can twice turn them, you know, turn them, then let them dry. So they're gonna to have to be stored for a period of time. And uh, you can see on a couple of these, we're already starting to get dry cracks on them just overnight. These were cut up yesterday and today they're already showing dry cracks. So if we really wanna keep them for long periods of time, we've got to seal the end grain of them and uh, let them uh, dry a little bit, but make sure they don't dry out the end grain too fast where they start cracking on us. Now, we do two things here. One, one of them is we're gonna anchor seal these or, or use a product. I get this at Rockler. It's, uh, it's called Greenwood's In Sealer, but it works very well and it's pretty well the same thing as anchor seal is. Uh, works real well. We're going to coat all of these with a coat of anchor seal. Well, that's not all we're going to be doing. What we are going to be doing is we are going to be grading these blanks. And in other words, we kind of graded them before we took them out of the slab because we uh, looked at both sides of the slab and tried to only pick the best wood. As you'll see as we go through this, there's always a few that sneak in there that had imperfections in the wood that you couldn't see even though you were looking at both sides of a three inch slab. So we will grade them. Now here's our long-term plan. We are gonna pick them up, grade them, find out if we got any that's got real problems that we wanna reject right now. And if they're good, we're gonna anchor seal them. And once we anchor seal them, we're gonna lay them out here for about three days. Then I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna pick each one of them up and re-grade it three days from now. And we're talking about Texas heat, so if you're northern, you may wanna lay a little longer. And I'm gonna turn it over and I'm gonna look for excessive cracking in the bowl. If there is, I'm gonna take some anchor seal and coat just those areas that's showing that still wants to crack. In other words, I'm not gonna coat the whole blank. I'm just gonna coat the area that's showing a problem. Some wood will absorb this stuff faster than others. It's also some wood has got more stresses in it than others. So this is just the nature of wood. So three days from now, I will grade them a second time. I will coat them when needed a second time. They will set out here about three more days. So six to seven days from now, I will come and I will grade them a third time and make sure that they're all stabilized at that point. If they do, I'm gonna go put them in here where I store wood and uh, let them, you know, they can stay till I get around to turning these things. Now you may notice this box of wood here. I take usually pine you know, that's what I use for utility wood. And these sticks are 3 8 inch square. 
You can make them what you want to, but I can stack a lot of, of these bow blanks up if I use only a 3 8 divider between them. So if I got too many for my bench right here, I'll actually stack them up with dividers between them. But definitely when I go on the shelf to shave to save shelf space, I'm gonna stack these things about this high. And to do that, there, there may be five or six of these type bowls just one on top of the other, but there's gonna be a spacer between them and they're setting on some wire. So if, if you had, a uh, say, a plywood shelf, I'd put actually these under the, the bottom blank. But these are handy. We use a lot of them, but what they do is keep these things. If I just take them in there and stack them like that, when you break these apart, there's gonna be black mildew in there because there's still moisture in this bowl blank and it is gonna ruin our bowl blanks unless we lay out a drying space with spacers. So let's get to it. Now I've used this doggy dish for several years now. And uh, it, I use a good brush and I got anchor seal in the bowl. I kind of try to use up most of it that's already in the bowl. But one neat thing about this uh, Greenwood sealer is it'll reconstitute itself. Just work your brush a little bit and pretty soon it'll start getting free. I'm just gonna start down here at this end and boy, that'll make a mess. All right, first bowl. The end grain is running this way. I do not want to co coat the whole, now the green range running up and down. All I want to coat is this end, the end grain piece of it. And then I want to coat just a little bit over the edge on the end grain end of it. And notice I'm leaving this side and this side open. I'm not putting anything inside. down. While I'm doing this, let's talk about something else. Most people kind of seem to like these videos to be kind of short. Since nearly all of them are training or schooling videos that I do, sometimes a subject, it just takes a long time to explain it. And this subject is one of them. Uh, we, because of the time it takes just to explain every little thing that we're doing, it slows down the process. And so what I want don't you do is, as you watch this video, think that it's gonna take me days to do this process. I sat down last night and was kind of going through the numbers. And in about one hour, we cut up three slabs on the sawmill. And then we come up here and I took a long time showing y'all how to lay these out on a slab. But after you do it a time or two, you won't take but shoot probably less than 10 minutes per slab. Let's say 30 minutes to lay out these bowl blanks on your slabs. And uh, so what do we spend? We, we've been doing this an hour and a half for three slabs. And then you take a chainsaw and another 10 minutes per slab, I can cut all these bow blanks loose. So, okay, that's another 30 minutes. So we've only got two hours invested in 66 bow blanks at this point. We're gonna take them in the shop like we did yesterday and cut them into these circles. And For all 66, well, for these 22, it took about 30 minutes. So that's another 30. 
if I got 66 of them, I'm going to spend an hour and a half in the shop cutting these out on a circle jig. So we've been at this three hours, four if you're slow, and we have cut up, cut out, circle jigged, and brought them to this table in four hours. 66 turning blanks. That's why this, this is so efficient. All right, I'm going to spend some time anchor seal them here. About 10 minutes to do all of these. We got 66 of them to do. So 30 minutes I'm going to spend doing this. Of course, I'm grading them as I go, so that don't take no extra time. So when I get through with this project, after I grade them and anchor seal them twice and grade them three times and then put them up on the shelf, you know, I'm looking at less than five hours of time making 66 bow blanks. Not only 66 bow blanks, 66 bow blanks that are perfect. That uh, we want all around the imperfections. So almost every one of them can be picked up and used. So, yes, this video is kind of long because I slowed down to show you all the finer points of it all. But in the end, you will find this is the most efficient way you can cut up your bow blanks. Now, keep in mind that not everybody has a sawmill to cut their slabs up or the ability to go get big trees before those slabs. You can go to a little mom pop sawmill, try Craigslist, they're always advertising lumber to thing, and they'll have logs. And you go out and pick the, the log you want to make your bow blanks. A big one, remember if this thing works a lot better with bigger logs, somewhere in the 20, 24 inch range. And um, pick your log up, then pay them to slab it to the right thickness you want. And you bring it home, and then surely you got a chainsaw if you're in the wood business. You cut out, mark, and then cut out your own blanks. And you can do this without honing a sawmill. Excuse me. You can do this without owning a sawmill and save a lot of money on these blanks. What is one of these blanks worth retail? Good question. After you do all this work, they're worth about $20 to $30 a board foot, depending where you're at and what the market will bear. For example, here's a 10 inch bowl blank. A 10 inch bowl blank is worth $30. So you can afford to spend a little money getting logs cut up at the sawmill if you're gonna save $20, $30 per bowl blank. Now, one thing that this gets you that's kind of, I won't say it's negative, it's just part of the deal. One is it, this uh, method ends up producing a lot of six inch bow blanks. Well, here's your turning wood and here's all the ones you swap to your buddies for something. Let's trade a little wood with them. Uh, we use give away a lot of these at our wood turning club at the meetings and stuff. Beginners can take them home and really quick turn a little bowl out of them. So there's uses for these six inch ones. And you, of course you can turn all kinds of stuff for Christmas presents out of six inch stuff. And then you can get real venturesome and turn something like this. A 14 incher if you've got the lathe that'll carry it. That's an $80 piece of wood there, guys. So how long, how many long can you stay in the wood turning business and go spend $80 for each turning blank you turn into a, a, a serving tray or shallow bowl that's this size? Takes a while, all right, just expensive. All right. Remember, I'm really grading these as I go. I'm looking for imperfections that will reject it 
be so bad that we wouldn't want to put it on the lathe. So far, everything I've seen has just been little knot inclusions that may or may not close up. And that is why I grade them three times over a week. Uh, this one has this little knot right here. Well, that anchor seal may have settled that and that may just be just fine. Or when I go look in three days, it may be cracked open. And that's why I re-grade them later on. So, we're having pretty good results. I'm not really seeing a lot of things come out that where we missed something when we were selecting our bow blanks on the slab. So, I'll, I'll put a chart at the end of this uh, video kind of talking about how much time we spent on each operation and what we got out of it and about what. Now these are pecan. Pecan's actually a high value wood for a turning blank and especially these few that had spalding in them. They're worth more. One of the rules of thumb if you're into spalding wood, if, if it's spalding, it's spalded beautifully. In other words, it's not just a little spalding, but it's spalded really beautifully. It's worth double what a regular bow blank is. So uh, think of that when you're looking and grading is pull out the ones that are exceptional. Because they have an exceptional value. All right. Last time I counted down here in the back, I had 32 different domestic woods in, in here in the wood lot. And that's mostly what I do all my lumber and bow blanks out of is local domestic wood. Uh, with the exception is cherry didn't grow in Texas and other needed is hard maple. So once every year or two, I'll make a trip up to Illinois to this logger I've become acquainted with and I'll call him ahead of time and I'll pull up and he'll have logs to my specifications laying there and I'll buy those logs and bring them back to Texas. It's a nine hour drive up there. You gotta stay the night and then nine hours back. But we pick up woods, those woods that uh, are, that don't grow here naturally locally. You know, one of the more popular woods to turn here that we have locally is uh, Black walnut, of course, is very popular. And uh, sycamore, at the, all the beginner schools and so forth, we use sycamore a lot. And we do that because it's a, a soft wood that's fairly easy to turn. And at our beginning schools that our wood turning club does, it's just a good wood to work with. The last Sycamore I brought home, I, I found, blew over in the storm. It was uh, 38 inches diameter. Made uh, five slabs. We cut it with a chainsaw mill and got five slabs out of it, three and six inch material. And I think it made, that one log made 120 bow blanks what we cut out using this method here with by slabbing it first and cutting them out. And that was two years ago and we've been through most of them already. <laughs> we gotta find another big sycamore tree. All right. So,
add just a little more. You don't have to wear gloves for this, but it sure is a mess to get off your hands. So I just wear gloves because it's easy to clean up afterwards. Now this bowl, I don't clean it up. I, I, sometimes I'll try to use up everything that's in there, but it'll reconstitute when you put fresh stuff on top and you can go ahead and use that over and over and over. Don't throw away the paintbrush just because you used it once. 22 bowl blanks done. About 12 minutes I've anchor sealed them and graded them for the first time. All right, we will uh, come back in three days, regrade them, and ink spot anchor seal the ones that need it. And then three days after that, we'll put them up. Now, I don't put labels on them. When they're on the shelf, because you can mix up woods, I put labels on every piece of wood because a lot of our wood turners come out and pick out wood for themselves. Um, the reason I don't do it is supposed to, this is Sunday, or Saturday, I'm sorry, this is Saturday evening, and uh, it's supposed to rain Monday or Tuesday, so these may get wet. Well, it ain't gonna hurt them to sit out here and get wet, but if I put labels on them, the label, writing on the label will fade away. So I wait till I'm ready to take them inside before I put labels on them. If I'm using more, processing more than one species of wood at a time, I have two of these setups, and I'll put the other species over there so they don't get mixed up, keep them separate. So, there's a lot of ways you can do this, but what I hope to, turn, to pass on to you is the new way of doing it to where you can turn out a large amount of bowl blanks for yourself and your other wood turning buddies very quickly. Um, it's so much more efficient going down there and trying to take a chainsaw and cut this slab that's probably wedge shape and then you gotta cut the corners off of it and also you you couldn't find the imperfections until after you cut it so you end up leaving a bunch of it down in the wood as firewood because you found imperfections in it this method the new method you find the imperfections before you ever cut out a bowl and then the method is fast about producing a lot of turning blanks all right that's it for this time This was what I was trying to explain about the anchor seal. Uh, after I put the anchor seal on there, you wait a few days and look at this same piece, how all the cracks closed up on it as you uh, slowed down the drying process and quit letting it crack on the outside surface, make it dry evenly. And the anchor seal will help you do that, or greenwood sealer. So uh, very effective about not ruining your bowl blanks by dry cracking. All right, this is the third time around for these 22 bowl blanks out of our first slab that we processed. They've been now laying out here about four days since we done the second inspection and grading and then put the extra anchor seal where needed. I just got through going through every one of these. They don't need any more anchor seal. None of them have showed up any problems. So out of 22 blanks, the two blanks that we rejected last time are the only two that kind of failed the test. Everything else is quality bow blanks and they're ready to go on the shelf. So since they're ready to go on the shelf, we need to label them. What I have uh, figured out and I do on, to keep them separate, because sometimes we got a lot of different woods up there is, I'll take an Excel spreadsheet and I print the name of the wood and the uh, biological name on it and then before right before we put it up we will just staple those labels on there and then no matter if somebody mixes them up by moving them around and on the shelves which really happens quite often uh, that uh, we still know which species of wood is a lot of woods look very similar once they're cut you get away from the bark and the leaves which are the primary identifiers it's uh hard to identify them so it, this is uh, the best practice i want to think so we'll continue to label these and then we will go in there and put them on a shelf 
Remember too, that if they want this to be put on the shelf, they've got to be put in there with a spacer between them to keep them from molding and mildewing. So we'll do that as we stack them up on the shelves and they'll be there for us when we get ready to come get them and use them. Now, these are pecan and some of these had some nice spalding in them. I have labels that I've made up that says spalded pecan. So if I see one that's exceptionally, I may put a spalded pecan label on it and that kind of gets set aside because that's an exceptional bowl. So anyway, we'll get them put on the shelves, get them stored till we get ready to use them, take them to the shop and make something out of them. All right, after 6.2 hours of uh, processing these bowl blanks all the way from when we started cutting them on the sawmill to the time they're laying on this table and fully anchor sealed, uh, we're done with these bowl blanks. They just need to be labeled and put in here on the shelf. Uh, between all of these operations that got us here, I explained what happened and how to do each one of them. Uh, what we get out of this operation, the new way of turning bow blanks is really fast production on producing these 56 bow blanks. Uh, at the same time, we get a better quality bow blank out of it by using this method. So it's quick. And it's uh, fairly easy once you get it down. I've included this chart in, in the rear of this video, so it might take a minute to look at it, and it really lays out how long it took to do each operation and how quick and efficient it is once you're not uh, just doing the operation. Uh, what happened on this video that made it so long is I had to stop and explain to you what I was doing on every one, and that takes up a lot of time. If you, after you get the process down at your home and start doing this, you'll find out how really quick it goes when you're not having to stop and explain something. Just do the process. Uh, cut the bowl blanks out and get them ready, get them sealed. It's a, a very efficient, certainly cr creates a better quality bowl blank than the old chainsaw method. So here we are, 56 bowl blanks. We're looking good, we're ready to go turn some wood. As I was uh, doing this, I just run some figures on uh, what these bow blanks would sell for if I was selling them. Uh, most of my wood, I just sell by the board feet, how many board feet's in them. Now one thing you'll notice as you look at these charts you see is here's our three inch bow blanks, but here's our six inch bow blanks. And it takes longer to use a chainsaw and cut them up. It takes longer to go in there on a circle jig and cut them up. It even takes longer to anchor seal a six inch bow blank versus a three. There's just more volume there. But it's not a lot. You see the numbers, it's, it's controllable and usable. I want to thank. Now, during this process, I want to point out that uh, three or six inch bow blanks is not all you can produce. Uh, quite often in the past, we have come across desirable wood turning logs like sycamore or something that's three foot diameter plus. Well, when you take the pith in the middle, you can get a really deep bowl if you want to have some really nice wood. So if you, if you don't want a three inch bowl or six inch, you can have a nine inch, 12 inch or whatever your log will allow you out of it through this same process. It just takes very large logs to get there. And most people don't have those giant lace it'll take to turn a bowl, you know, it's this big and this thick. It uh, takes exceptionally large uh, lathe to do that. So whatever you've got, you've got the small lace, man, you got a bunch of eight inch bowl blanks. It's just the right size to fit on your lathe. You got the big lathe, we got big ones too. So you cut them out based on what you've got available to turn them and what you plan to do with them. Uh, the other thing is they do not even have to be three inches thick. Some people like to turn flat platters and you only need like a two inch piece of wood to do that. So you could cut these things on your sawmill or your slab down just two inches and make some nice little flat platters out of them. So whatever your needs are and what you plan to turn, you go back and that's what you cut your bowl blank thickness for. And that, it's a matter of how big a bowl blank you can get out of any particular log getting around the problems that all wood has inside their logs. And that is really the beauty of this system is we've eliminated all those bad problems before we ever cut the blank out. So, a lot to learn, but I hope this will help you out in the future in your wood turning. For now, good luck.
You might wonder what you get out of this 56 bowl blanks if you take the time a little more than half a day to cut all of these up. Well, in cutting them up, there's some expenses. Uh, I had to go get the logs. I had to cut them up on a sawmill. I had to bring them up here with an expensive tractor. Uh, we end up taking them in the shop and using expensive band saws to cut them up. So there's some overhead having to do with your equipment, tools and equipment. And then we got to have storage room in here. All of that is an expense. So not everything is a profit when you start making something. But just to give you an idea of what these things bring on the open market, I sell bowl blanks just by the board feed, about, in other words, the volume of wood that is in a bowl blank. And uh, so if you look at that, here's a six inch bowl blank. And that six inch bowl blank is worth 14 bucks, $14. If you go to an eight inch bowl blank, that's worth $24. A 10 inch bowl blank is worth $38. An 11 inch and a half inch bowl blank is worth $50. So that's kind of what big bowl blanks that are high quality sells for. So you can recover some of your expenses for producing these things by selling some of these to your buddies. Uh, or if you're in the business, you know, the problem where this thing falls apart is if you try to make a business out of this is you then you got to have a business and you got a marketing y'all. One of the real downsides is say you set up a website and you decide to sell wood blanks. The problem is these things are just a so dang heavy. I may sell a wood blank, but that, that probably cost me $25 just to ship it. It's just too much weight. Remember, these are green wood. They're very high quality, but just the, just drives the expense through the roof when you start trying to ship them somewhere. And so that's the issue if you decide to do something with your bowl blanks, other than just horse trade them with your friends or sell them to some local people that can come get them. It's, uh, it's a long road to turn it into a business, but this sure will make it more pleasurable for you to uh, do wood turning, to have all of this at your disposal when you get ready to turn uh, bowls or whatever on your lathe. So that's an example of what these things normally bring on the open market.